Hello, my name is Greg Stewart. I'm a veterinarian and a medical microbiologist, and my veterinary practice serves a small ruminant industry, which includes cervids. Today, um, my objective is to produce a piece, an interactive piece, an educational piece about chronic wasting disease and transmissible spongiform encephalopathies, prion diseases. We'll hopefully learn today. The goals of the of the presentation are to have you to learn, uh, to have you to think, um, to have you to watch diligently um, it, this in our in our country and in our flocks and herds, and then to ask questions. So let's have a frank discussion about CWD. The definition of CWD is chronic wasting disease. This is a disease that is present in white-tailed deer, mule deer, elk, red deer, moose, black-tailed deer, psyca deer. It is one of a group of diseases which are classified as a transmissible spongiform encephalopathy, a TSE. What do we know about other TSEs? Most of us know about mad cow disease, or BSE it's called, bovine spongiform encephalopathy. We may know about scrapie in uh, sheep and goats. We may know about kuru, which was a disease in Papua New Guinea. We may know about mink encephalopathy. And some of these are old veterinary diseases. Scrapie we've known about for hundreds of years. Mink encephalopathy we've known about for 50 years. Uh, CWD we've known about for 30 years, bovine spongiform encephalopathy we've known about for 20 years and we're learning rapidly today more and more about this, these TSEs. TSEs would be classified as rare neurodegenerative, mostly fatal uh, pathologies that are associated with accumulations of plaques in neural tissue and the brain of the target species. They can be spontaneous, um, they're genetically modified and modulated, they can be uh, infective, and they have an extremely long incubation period. We do know that there are species barriers of most TSEs. It's very difficult to infect one species with another species prion. This genetic resistance plays a, a primary part in a number of these diseases. We know that males are more diseased than females. The history of CWD in the United States goes back to the 1960s in Colorado, where wild elk were placed in pens in a Northeast Colorado State research facility. And the origin is postulated as coming from one of three separate places. One, that this was a, a scrapie disease from sheep that had mutated, that it originally is derived from sheep and it jumped over into the cervid species, and in this case it was mule deer. The second possibility is that this was a, a disease of, of mule deer originally. It, it was a spontaneous alteration in these mule deer and that and we got started that way. And a third possibility is that CWD is derived from another uh, currently unidentified source of infection. Um, question comes is, are there humans, are there human TSEs that could be infecting uh, uh, animals? The clinical signs of CWD are generally that the animal is unthrifty, in other words he's lost a lot of weight, chronic wasting disease. He has staggering, he has tremors, he has ataxia, um, excess salivation, swallowing problems, uh, hair loss, depression, itching, etc. A long line of, of clinical signs, um, many of which can be confused with uh, EHD in deer or blue tongue in deer. Since 1998, the United States has um, performed 848,000 tests for CWD. Of these 848,000 tests, and that number is growing, 3,600 positives have shown up in free-range cervids. That includes deer, elk, and, and uh, both species of deer. 403 of these samples were positive in captive herds. 289 of those captive herd positives were in elk, and 114 were in deer. 
as the sensitivity and the sophistication of our testing technology uh, is improved, uh, the incidence is increasing. When we make things more sensitive and start looking more, generally we find more. In order to understand this neurodegenerative disease, uh, which, which is um, we call a TSE, we need to understand a little bit about protein formation and function. There are basically four levels of protein structure that have to do with its function. One is the amino acids that are assembled uh, in a chain, uh, sequence in a chain. The second is how these things may be folded. These amino acid chains may be folded. The third, how they may be spiraled or coiled uh, and folded back against each other and then moved again into what is known as the four types of structure of protein. So this, in the dogma of molecular biology, we are told that DNA makes RNA and RNA makes protein. A gene turns on from a DNA library, a messenger RNA is created, and that messenger RNA moves out into the cytoplasm away from the nucleus of the cell, and it starts making protein. And these proteins are receptors on the surface to are signaling the arrival of other proteins, etc. They lodge in the outer cell membranes and preserve the cell as they stay there. As a frame of reference to understand TSEs versus traditional infections, that we talk about. Viruses, bacteria, and fungi have genes and DNA or RNA, nucleic acids. Prions have no genes. They have no nucleic acids, DNA, or RNA that we've found to date. Prions are resistant to ultraviolet light, which normally inactivates these nucleic acids, these DNAs and RNAs. There's no immune system in the fight with prion disease. This is fairly new stuff. There's no inflammation and there's no fever associated with these. In, in the study of protein, there was dogma. And the dogma says that one protein has one shape and that one shape has one function. We've undone all of this with our study of prions. What are prions? Well, in nature, prions are fragrant little birds in the albatross family. Those are called prions. That's the first place we encounter prions in science. They've been, they've been given a, a, another place in science, and they are small, proteinaceous, infectious particles. Proines, but that doesn't sound good, so the laboratory that we're working on these changed those proteinaceous, infectious, um, and made the acronym PREON, and have settled on that acronym. This old set of veterinary diseases that we know about smoldered along scrapy mink encephalopathy and it wasn't until um, recent history when a transmissible spongiform encephalopathy uh, in cattle and some linked disease in humans um, brought huge amounts of funding into the into this area of science and the TSE in humans that we talk about is called CJD it stands for Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. And, and CJD, normal CJD, appears in the human population in one, of, in one of several ways. In general, that's a sporadic or spontaneous disease. And the incidence of that disease is around one, one in one million. Now, we have inadvertently transmitted uh, CJD around, which is called iatrogenic transmission. This sporadic and spontaneous CJD can be inadvertently or, or iatrogenically transmitted to other humans. How does this happen? Through corneal transplants from positive patients, through surgical equipment used in positive patients, in, in, in normal patients. Um, previously, before we had recombinant human growth hormone that's used uh, in human patients, we used pituitary extracts. To, um, for the source of the HGH. Um, these, this, was, uh, uh, this created um, CJD in humans and it resulted in 200 human deaths. 
There's also a process where duramater in brain and head uh, surgeries is used as a transplant duramater from one patient used in another. This is probably the source of 200 other human cases. Neurosurgeons, uh, those are areas where we inadvertently and iatrogenically move CJD around. There's also an interesting um, study of some Libyan Jews where the incidence is 32 times that of the normal population. In other words, the incidence is 32 per million, not one per million. The male to female ratio in these Libyan Jews has increased. They have a predilection for eating sheep eyeballs. This has been studied. Brains lightly cooked in paper, but they may in fact actually be a carrier of CJD or they carry a gene that actually makes them more prone to the disease. So this is illustrative of the genetic component side of some of these TSEs. We'll learn more about that in the, in, later in the lecture. So this is a story really of bad company. You and I, uh, most animals, have normal prion protein embedded into the surface uh, of cells in our, in our brain, in our nerve, trans, in our nerve synapses, etc. And what happens in, in, in the case of prion infection, an abnormally folded prion of the same amino acid sequence comes in and, and comes in close contact with our normal prion protein that you and I have. And this is a one-way street. It's a mystery actually how this happens, but at the end of the day, two abnormals emerge. And these abnormals are tightly folded and they're stacked and they're enzyme resistant and they're different. They're basically isoforms of our own natural protein. Okay, our own natural amino acid chains are just a different isoform. And these things as they accumulate in tissue, they have a very tight, uh, aggressive clumping action. These, these clusters of clumps um, become rod shaped fibrils. Um, these fibrils grow in length and they stick together to form plaques or blobs. And these dark blobs, these twizzlers, these accumulation of plaques, show up in the brains of the affected species. Now these plaques, these twizzlers, these blobs, are not infective on their own. They have to be shaken, moved apart, brought back to a more elementary form, that single isoform to become infective. Now how does disease and death occur in these animals, in this species? Is it because of the accumulation of plaques in the brain or is it because of the disappearance of our normal prion protein that each of us have? It may be some combination of both. We've created animals uh, in science now that, that are transgenic enzyme deficient, protein deficient, so that they don't have normal prion proteins. And we've done this with cows and we've done this with rats. And those animals are not infected with prion disease because they have no target protein. It's been, it's been removed from them. These animals can live, but we have concerns about what the function of those normal proteins are that become infected and misfolded. And it looks as though these normal proteins are are functional in circadian rhythms of animals, day and night cycles, um, day length cycles, etc. They're important in smell, the transmission of nerve impulses, having to do with seizures. Uh, they have to do with deterioration of the peripheral nerves and cell, cell suicide or apoptosis. Uh, they modulate the immune system and they may have effects in long-term memory. Money started pouring into the area of TSEs once the Mad Cow Saga began in Europe. And, and in December of 1984, Dr. David B. went to a farm in Sussex um, and, and he saw some cattle that were strangely affected. October of 83 to May of 1985, on another farm in England, similar symptoms were, uh, were shown in, in cattle. In April of 85, we see more in, in Kent. In 1985 in September, Dr. Carol Richardson, a pathologist, looked at tissues of these animals and she said this was scrapie in cattle. 
In 1987, there was an official notification of a new disease in cattle in the, United, in the United Kingdom. But there was some political influence on science. There were papers that were squashed. There was, in, in, in uh, a few words, there was a cover-up uh, that delayed the information, the true science information, from getting out. And this had to do with worries about markets of, of various types of products. CWD is a TSE in cervix. This disease is not highly infectious, it's not economically devastating, and it's not transmissible to man by normal methods. I want to tell you a story about the Alberta elk industry. In far northern Alberta, one elk was diagnosed positive for CWD. The ministry came in and they sacrificed killed all the animals on that farm. They went out to places where the sales were made from that farm, which would be contact controls, and, and killed all of those animals that had a direct link from this farm, plus their contact controls. And, they, and this kept going, and kept going for many ranches. And over the course of a five-year history in Canada, thousands of elk were slaughtered, Thousands of elk were indemnified by the taxpayers of Canada. And only the one index elk was positive. All other tissues were normal. They were negative. So in this case, the elk industry in, in Alberta was not decimated by CWD. It was decimated by government edict. The tissues from that index elk are no longer available for scientists to evaluate. Let's talk about some facts of CWD. Most pin deer originally came from the wild. And we're gonna talk about TSEs and CWD, but we don't feed meat and bone meal to deer, which was part of the scenario in the United Kingdom with BSE. Off all from sheep and goats and cattle were being fed back to cattle. It's illegal to feed meat and bone meal from ruminant sources to ruminants in the United States and has been for a while. If by chance CWD was a novel scrapie protein, um, the USA has a low population of sheep compared to other sheep growing areas in the world. Scrapie infected mutton and lamb have been eaten for centuries with no ill effects in man. We know this has happened since the 1700s. CWD infected meat has been eaten for many years with no ill effects. Native Americans, some are even followed quite diligently. In Oneida County, New York, the Verona Fire Department put on a game supper. Inadvertently, a CWD positive deer carcass was made into venison and fed to a number of participants in that game, in that game supper. These people have been followed for quite some time and no one has turned up positive from that game supper. And the end of the surveillance is coming in 2014. What one needs to know about TSEs is there's a significant species barrier for prion infections. And there's a, there's a genetic resistance and susceptibility to prion disease. Species barriers, however, can be breached by laboratory manipulations such as scrapie infected tissue being injected into the brains of other species, CWD infected material injected into the brains of other species and so forth. But there is a distinct pattern of the histopathology lesions of these prion diseases. The IHC, immunohistochemistry lesions in the brain of, of sheep are characteristic of scrapie. The IHC lesions in the brain of CWD are characteristic of CWD. The same is true of mink, the same is true of BSC, CWD, CJD, Kuru, etc. The incubation period for these TSEs is very long, in, in most cases years. Uh, BSE it was probably in British cattle of multiple areas in the United Kingdom as BSE for many more years than was divulged in the UK BSE outbreak. Again, as the technology improves, the number of positive cases usually improves in any surveillance system. 
And it's easier to find CWD in pens where certification programs are in place than it is in the wild. In pen certification programs, any, in order to remain certified, any animal death in those pens has to be sampled. So 100% of the mortality, regardless of the source of the mortality, is tested. In the wild, we don't have that luxury. In the case of Kuru, TSEs were spread from, from human to human by cannibalism. In the case of BSE, TSEs were spread from cow to cow by refeeding offal from other cattle, sort of cattle cannibalism. Genetic resistance in man to CJD is well known. Um, and if you look at the variant CJD outbreak associated or linked with BSE in England, we find that one substitution at, at one link in our amino acid chain to make, to make a heterologous set of amino acids at one position codes for resistance and also for longer incubation periods. The British people as a people are 37% homologous at position 129 in the chain of amino acids, methionine, methionine. 13% are homologous at the same position uh, for valine, valine, and 50% and are heterologous. In other words, they're different amino acids at that position, which is valine and methionine. And of the cases of variant CJD that were studied in the United Kingdom, of 171 cases, 100% of all of those cases were homologous for methionine, methionine at that position. So there's a very highly uh, genetically influenced uh, portion to this disease. Lost in Space, a TV show, we frequently heard danger, Will Robinson, danger. Frequently, the, the potential threat of danger uh, to the human population is, is used to gin up funding and political support for a project or a disease or a theater of science. In my professional career, we've heard three times an example uh, of, of it wasn't if the swine flu was going to cause a tremendous pandemic in the United States, but when. We've heard this in 1976, 1998, and 2012. To date, we haven't suffered this terrible pandemic. And the first predictions of uh, variant Creutzfeldt-Jakob syndrome in Europe associated and linked with BSE, the predictions were that tens of thousands of people would die from variant Creutzfeldt-Jakob syndrome. I think the number is more like 245. And there hasn't been a positive case. Um, maybe there's two positive cases since 2008. So the incidence is decreasing. We also heard danger, Will Robinson, about the salmonella infections in the, in the 1990s. Let's talk about the transmission of CWD for a little bit. The movement of CWD across borders is routinely blamed on farm deer and elk. The movement of deer carcasses or deer products from hunter kills or by potentially scavenger birds uh, is just as likely. There's no way to definitively prove which came first when we look at cases where there's an incidence in a farm deer and there's an incidence in a wild deer just outside of the farm fence. The case of New York is one of the best cases. In 2005, there were approximately five deer diagnosed positive for CWD in, in New York in Oneida County. Several of those were inside of farmed operations, Several of those were outside the farmed operation. They threw a containment uh, zone around there and 29,000 samples later, um, those, those five deer were the only deer that they found. They did a, they, the percentage of in, infectivity in there was 0.0007%. So there's areas of the country where we can look at farm deer and we can look at wild deer and look at the incidents in both, and, and it's impossible to determine whether who infected what. But we're going to look at some graphs and some geographic distribution of this, 
and just ask some questions so that we eventually can understand this. Now, in terms of any new disease, we generally will use a, a, a paradigm of what's called sentinel animals. For example, if we're looking for a West Nile virus in the United States, in the eastern United States, we'll put out susceptible animals and we'll, uh, and we'll go back and, and, and surveil those animals looking for antibodies for exposures to certain things. So sentinel animals are an important part of understanding disease transmission and understanding uh, infectivity and incidence and whether something's rare or whether something's common. And the first question a normal thinking uh, deer hunter or deer farmer or Joe, Joe Plummer on the street would ask is, is there an increased, increased incidence of TSEs in the following populations? Taxidermists, deer processors, deer raisers, deer hunters, doe urine collectors, doe urine processors, antler velvet users, deer biologists, deer transport personnel, deer veterinarians, venison consumers, or hide tanners? And the answer to that is no. Now, wouldn't it be very nice if we could use an anti-mortem test rather than to sacrifice our animals in order to confirm or deny that they were positive for CWD? Well, rectal biopsy could be approved today by USDA for white-tailed deer only. There's enough verification and testing that's been done that, that, that the USDA is satisfied that this test could be used um, for CWD. And this, by the way, is the test of choice for translocation of white-tailed deer should one government agency want to move deer from one locale to another. Let's look at the CWD incidence in America. 90,000 samples, roughly, per year have been tested since 2002. In farm surveys, we see 55 herds in 11 states that are positive. In wild surveys, we see positive animals in 16 states. The farm survey incidence is lower than the wild incidence on a percentage of animals tested basis. This is a bar chart of the number of samples that have been tested in wild cervids since 2002 and, and they're roughly 90,000 samples per year. Let's look at the geographic distribution of CWD in the United States prepared in slightly different formats. The gray areas are states, entire states where CWD have been found in captive populations. The yellow is areas of CWD in wild populations. This chart shows the cumulative distribution of CWD amongst farm cervids. The green dots represent elk farms. The blue dots represent deer farms. The orange dots represent captive deer and elk farms. The next chart shows depopulated sites of farm cervids. Again, the legend green is, is elk and blue is deer. So this is farms that were positive and have been depopulated. The next illustration is the current distribution of CWD amongst farm cervids. The legend is the same, green for elk and blue for deer. The next illustration is the current distribution of CWD amongst free-ranging cervids. In this illustration of the current distribution of CWD in free-ranging cervids, the legend is somewhat different. The colors have changed. In this one, green equals moose, blue equals elk, and red or pink equals deer of all species. The last slide that I'd like to show you is the current distribution of CWD amongst farm cervids in the United States. And I'd like to have you compare this to the map of the free-ranging cervids in the United States. It's interesting to note in the case of, of Wisconsin, which has depopulated a number of CWD farms, that somewhere between 150 and 170,000 samples have been taken in wild animals. And they've found about 1,125 samples that were positive. 
Over that same period of time, 22,500 samples were tested in farm cervids, only 99 of which were positive. So 0.44% incidence in farm cervids and anywhere from 2 to 10% shows up in the surveys of wild animals, uh, yearling female all the way up to adult male, the male being higher incidence than the female. I hope you enjoyed our educational session today. My intent was to inform and to make you question and to make you think and to ask questions of, of the literature that you read and see and hear. There are also additional resources if you wish to learn more about CWD. You can go to the Chronic Wasting Disease Alliance website. You can go to USDA's website on CWD. You may go to CDC's section on CWD, and you can also discover more publications under PubMed. So thank you for watching, and I hope that this has been informative for you.